Category 4 hurricane takes Galveston, Texas by surprise. The island is crushed under 15 feet of water and a mountain of rubble. This wall of debris was filled with pieces of houses, furniture, pianos, pots, pans, cats, dogs, and people. When it's over, there are more dead than can be counted or buried. It was too horrible. Eight to 12,000 people died in one night. The photographs are visual, but they really can't convey the magnitude of the event. Entire families are lost. People realize that if Galveston were to survive at all, they would have to have protection from future storms. Galveston responds with an audacious plan to rebuild. This is a tremendous scientific and technological accomplishment for that time or any time. On this episode of When Weather Changed History, a great city fights back from catastrophe. But even the most heroic efforts may not be enough. Galveston's been very lucky for a long time, and human nature is to kind of hope that your luck continues. September 12, 2008. Galveston, Texas is in the crosshairs of Hurricane Ike. The eye of the storm is still hours away, but massive waves are already crashing on the seawall. This 17-foot high barrier is the island's best hope for survival. It's also a reminder of the worst natural disaster in the country's history more than 100 years ago. Galveston. At the turn of the century, it's one of the most exciting cities in the United States. It was the premier city in Texas. It was called the Wall Street of the Southwest. Galveston is the fourth largest city in Texas, but it's the wealthiest by far. It was an era of grandeur and opulence, grace, and charm. There were magnificent homes, castle-like houses, ornate buildings. Galveston owes its success to good timing and geography. The island hosts a bustling deep seaport, perfectly situated to handle the country's thriving cotton and agricultural trade. The business district is headquartered along the Strand, named after a famous London street. And this was the financial center, not only of the Galveston County, but the entire state it was right here along the Strand. Merchants along there could bring in goods off the boats directly out of the back of their buildings and then sell them out the front. The island is about 30 miles long and only three miles wide. Its highest elevation is less than nine feet above sea level. While the north edge of the island is all business, the Gulf side is all pleasure. Galvestonians stroll the breezy beaches and enjoy the shade under the giant bathhouses. Also along the Gulf side is St. Mary's Orphanage. And it was wonderful beachfront property. They had two two-story dormitories with big balconies overlooking the Gulf. The nearest big city is Houston, about 50 miles inland. Although Houston has 7,000 more residents than Galveston, it's not nearly as prosperous or sophisticated. At that time, Galveston was the big, grand city, and Houston was really just the town up on the bayou. The two cities compete for shipping revenues, a rivalry that heated up in the late 1800s when a hurricane caused heavy damage in Galveston. Houston officials said it proved their city was better protected, making it more suitable for commerce. 
Galveston considers building a breakwater, but the plan is dismissed. City leaders don't want to project the image that Galveston might not be safe. Among those against building a seawall was Galveston's chief weather expert, Isaac Klein. In 1882, Klein had joined the U.S. Army Signal Corps, which later became known as the U.S. Weather Bureau. He rose through the ranks, serving in various cities before his assignment to Galveston in 1889. Along the way, he earned degrees in meteorology and medicine. Isaac Klein actually wrote an article in which he said Galveston could not be destroyed by a large wave. That article, published in the Galveston News years earlier, claimed it would be impossible for any cyclone to create a storm wave which would materially injure the city. Prevailing scientific consensus in those days was that the shallow waters could not produce a large tidal surge. The continental shelf was very shallow, so he felt like the waters would spread out and not be able to bring up any big waves or a, a giant storm surge. Isaac, his wife Cora, and three young daughters live in a stately home just blocks away from the beach. Isaac's younger brother Joseph lives with them. Joseph and Isaac worked together in the Galveston Weather Bureau office, located downtown in the Levy Building. Isaac runs the bureau with a firm hand. Readings are made and recorded with the utmost precision. When foul weather is in Galveston's forecast, signal flags are hoisted over the Levy Building's roof, which indicate the storm's type and direction. Tropical storms are not uncommon along the Gulf Coast, and islanders take them in stride. A red and black flag on top the Levy building means foul weather is on the way. Two flags would indicate the approach of a hurricane, but that warning was hardly ever given. Sometime near the end of August 1900, a storm takes shape between Africa and the Caribbean. By August 31st, it has traveled due west and is about 200 miles south of Puerto Rico. It continues its march, moving across the Dominican Republic and Haiti before changing course. Tuesday, September 4th. Isaac Klein receives an advisory telegraph from the Washington Bureau about a tropical storm disturbance moving northward over Cuba. Isaac takes note, but is not alarmed. Initially, as the storm moved across Cuba and into this extreme southeastern Gulf of Mexico, all the uh, indications were that the storm was going to move north, which would take it into Florida and ultimately up the east coast. On Thursday, September 6th, hurricane warnings are issued for the coast of Louisiana and points east. Advisories are given for cities as far north as Boston. Well, I doubt if there was any concern whatsoever in Galveston about the storm. Friday, September 7th. As the city swelters under a heat wave, Isaac Klein raises a red and black flag on top of the Levy Building warning residents of an approaching storm. That evening, however, the winds turn calm. A bright moon shines down. A city sleeps, unaware that the hurricane out in the Gulf is becoming a monster and headed their way. I don't think we can comprehend the degree of normalcy that prevailed right up to probably almost noontime of the day the storm hit. Saturday, September 8th, 1900. In the pre-dawn hours, Galveston's chief weather expert, Isaac Klein, and his family are asleep in their sturdy home just a few blocks from the beach. 
Isaac's younger brother Joseph lives there as well. Around 4 o'clock in the morning, Joseph Klein woke up and he had this feeling of impending disaster, that something was, was just not right. And he had a feeling that floodwaters were coming in and approaching the house. Joseph looks out a window and sees the backyard is under several inches of water. He wakes his older brother, Isaac, and together they go to the beachfront. And what they saw were these great waves breaking on the south shore. But they also noted that the winds were coming in strong from the north. Normally, northerly winds push the water out towards the sea. That's what Isaac Klein would have expected to see. Instead, what he saw were the big waves coming in and the tide moving up towards the center of the city. Isaac hurries to his downtown office. He notes that the barometric pressure has dropped only slightly since the night before. Residents wake up to a Saturday morning newspaper predicting that the hurricane will change its course or spend its force before reaching Texas. The weather actually was not that bad that Friday night and Saturday morning. There was no mention of a hurricane. Official forecasts issued from the Weather Bureau's Washington headquarters are based on observations transmitted from local offices. In years past, those local observations would have included data from Cuban forecasters who had pioneered the science of hurricane prediction. We were just getting into this. We hadn't been in it as long as the Cubans had. But after the Spanish-American War in 1898, the U.S. government installed its own weather observers in Cuba. Washington believed the Americans were more scientific and therefore more credible than their Cuban counterparts. In fact, the Cubans had a far better track record and a well-deserved reputation for accuracy. We resented it, you know, the Weather Bureau resented it, the government resented it. So they censored the news information on weather coming from Cuba. A fatal mistake. Early that Saturday morning, a Cuban meteorologist writes a forecast that will be published days later in the Havana newspaper, La Lucha. He says the storm that just left Cuba had developed characteristics of a full-blown hurricane. The article predicts that it will intensify even more as it pushes into the warm waters of the Gulf. The forecast from Havana also predicts the hurricane will make landfall on the Texas coast. It's a forecast Galveston never hears. On Saturday morning, residents go about their business. I think most people were expecting to have a rainy, windy day at worst. After 8 a.m., rain starts falling on the island. People celebrate the end of the hot spell that's plagued them for days. As the tides began to shift inland, the little rivers of water began running up the streets towards the center of town. Actually, from most accounts that I've read, uh, children are out playing in the water. My grandfather was six years old at the time of the storm, and he tells me that that morning he was out playing. And he said it was a lot of fun because the streets were then flooded, and they could take sticks, and they would put the sticks, which they considered to be big ships, and race them down the street. They would look at the beautiful waves crashing and they'd go, wow, that is, that's awesome. The festive atmosphere is short-lived. And the waves became higher and higher and pushed further and further inland. At the beach, residents watch as the surf pounds the bathhouses and breaks them apart. 
people began to realize that a serious disaster was unfolding. At St. Mary's Orphanage, high waves eat away at the sand dunes, a natural barrier between the gulf and the dormitory. And they watched these big sand dunes just disappear. So the sisters had the boys come into the girls' dormitory because it was the newer and stronger of the two. Just after 10 a.m., the Galveston Weather Bureau gets a telegram from Washington predicting that the wind direction will change from northwest to northeast. Joseph Klein fires off a quick response, reporting heavy rain, thunderstorm clouds, and a falling barometer. He then returns to the roof of the Levy Building and discovers that the rain gauge has blown away. Winds are at 42 miles per hour, and the barometer has fallen slightly. The streets of Galveston turn into angry rivers. He was getting these large, slow breakers moving in, each one pushing a little further inland, beginning to roll up underneath the houses and beginning to wear away the foundations. At the orphanage, the sisters huddle inside with 93 children. The sisters gathered the children and had them sing Queen of the Waves. It was an old French hymn sung by sailors when they faced storms, seeking the protection of Mary, mother of Jesus. They sing while the sisters pray. But the waters continued to rise. Eventually, the Gulf waters approached the front steps of that dormitory. By mid-afternoon on Saturday, September 8th, hurricane-force winds tear across Galveston, Texas. People in the streets are swept off their feet by rushing floodwaters. John Blagden is a weather observer at the Galveston Bureau. At 5.15, he goes to the Levy Building roof to take the latest measurements. But when he looked for the instruments, he found that the winds were so strong that they had ripped all of the instruments used for measuring the velocity from the top of the building. While Blagden stays at the weather office, meteorologist Isaac Klein and his brother Joseph go home to care for their family. There, they find dozens of neighbors taking shelter in the house, considered one of the safest on the island. But at about 7.30 p.m., Isaac watches in horror as the water outside the house rises four feet in just four seconds. The waters of the bay had met the waters of the Gulf, and Galveston was no longer an island. It was simply a part of the ocean floor. The barometer plummets, indicating foul weather ahead. In the Levy Building, John Blagden logs a reading of 28.43 inches, lower than anything the U.S. Weather Bureau has ever seen on land. As the floodwaters surge into St. Mary's Orphanage, the sisters rush the children to the second floor. The sisters took clothesline and they cut it into sections and each sister tied to her own body between six and eight children. The dormitory rises off its foundation, floats for a moment, then sinks. There are no photographs of the hurricane in progress. All that's left are artists' interpretations of Galveston being swallowed alive. This is a lithograph of the 1900 storm. The survivors are taking refuge on rooftops or making their way through flooded areas. Flood water and winds up to 120 miles per hour tear the city apart, brick by brick. Think of a huge storm surge, and then you got wave action on top of that. It's just like a huge battering ram. And that's exactly what it did. 
It just battered all the other debris until it threw that into the next building, into the next building, to the next building. When the houses went down, people got tangled in the debris and drowned. My grandfather found something to act as a raft. He put his wife and his five children on the raft, but there wasn't room for him. So he grabbed the first thing he could grab, which was a piano. And he watched as some of the family were washed overboard and could not do anything to help them. Inside their home, Isaac and Joseph Klein watch as a sickening collection of churning debris floats by. It was everything. It was fences, it was the remains of houses, it was animals, it was vehicles, uh, horse carts. Then a railroad trestle, more than a thousand feet long, breaks free and smashes into the Klein family home, knocking it off its foundation. It floated a little ways, it tilted, and then it sank like a rock. September 1900, a ferocious hurricane is drowning Galveston, Texas. Residents are thrown from their stately homes into the dark, raging water. Galveston's chief weather expert, Isaac Klein, and his family fight for their lives after their house is knocked off its foundation. His brother, Joseph, grabs two children. Isaac holds on to another child and his wife, but they are quickly separated in the storm. His wife, Cora May, was trying to reach him and he watched his wife become entangled in the debris and taken under, and the house sank. Other neighbors tried desperately to save themselves and their homes. Linda McDonald's family chops through their floor with axes. Her grandfather was just six years old at the time. He figured they were gonna die. He said this had to be madness, chopping through to get to the water. They chopped through and the water came up and it settled down the house. Years later, her grandfather told Linda about the awful sounds that night and how the houses seemed to cry. And I said, Grandpa, you're pulling my leg. I said, I know, because houses don't cry. And he said, that night, everyone, everything cried. river of debris rolls across the island. Joseph Klein manages to climb onto a makeshift raft with two of Isaac's three children. Years later, he would write about that awful day. Joseph's grandson, Jerry, reads the memoir, telling of how, during Joseph's darkest hour, he sees something almost too good to be true. My heart suddenly leaped with uncontrollable joy. And two figures that clung to the drift, I discovered my brother and his youngest child. In some miraculous manner, they had escaped alive from the house of doom. Only the mother, one of the dearest of women, was gone. The tumbling wreckage makes its way from the Gulf side of the island toward the center of town. And this wall of debris was filled with pieces of houses, furniture, pianos, pots, pans, cats, dogs, and people. As it gathers its deadly cargo, the wall grows bigger and heavier. Eventually, it creates the one thing Galveston desperately needed but did not have. And so much debris accumulated along this line that I'm pointing out now that it created a breakwater protecting the interior of Galveston, the region of partial destruction, from the worst effects of the storm. Finally, after hours of merciless assault, the winds die down. The water begins to recede. Sunday, September 9th. A beautiful sunrise reveals an otherworldly scene on Galveston Island. People woke up the next morning. Those who survived realized that they had been very fortunate. 
More than 3,500 houses are destroyed. Thousands more are damaged. Entire blocks are swept clean. Familiar landmarks have disappeared. This rare footage is shot by one of Thomas Edison's assistants. The camera is among the first of its kind. Texas guardsmen are leery of outsiders with cameras, so the assistant claims his newfangled equipment is survey gear. The guardsmen relent, and he films the only motion pictures of what's left behind by nature's most terrible assault on U.S. soil. You know, on the Weather Channel, you'll see tornado damage, and these homes are literally wiped out. Well, imagine blocks and blocks of that to where there's no reference points. You can't see the corner grocery anymore. It's just wood wreckage for as far as you can see. In an audio taped history recorded 70 years after the hurricane, Paul Betancourt's grandmother remembers how her aunt couldn't find her house in the unrecognizable landscape. Their only clue was a family pet. They never would have found their place, but my aunt had a pony, and it was up in the attic. The Walsing families had a parrot. Of course, and the parrot's name was Polly. I mean, you can't make this up, it's real, okay? That's right. So this Polly, uh, the parrot, was in the attic. And the attic didn't go to pieces. It just sat on top of the house. The next month, the Polly was hiding for pretty Polly, pretty Polly. And that's how they found where they lived. Other families are not as lucky. The grandparents of mine that lived in this house that was probably tumbling down the street, well, both grandparents and four sons and one daughter were all killed. But my grandmother and three older children were away from home, and they lived. Her surviving grandmother wrote about it years later. Never got home again or see anybody, mother, father, four brothers, Oldest was 15, and a sister 22 months. Never found one body. I guess they washed a sea along with about 15,000 others that never had a chance. With thousands dead, there's no easy answer to the question of what to do with all the remains. It quickly became apparent that some sort of a strategy was needed. Traditional burial is impossible. The water table was too high. The ground was, the ground was saturated. So they decided to place the bodies on a barge and take it out to sea. They did this for two or three days until they discovered that the bodies were washing ashore. So to prevent disease, to prevent pestilence, they simply decided to burn the bodies where they lay, where they found them. It's hard for us to comprehend. It was like a scene from Dante's Inferno. There were smoke from the cremations 24 hours a day. The wind was actually fairly light a couple of days, and the smoke settled of the city. The stench was everywhere. Teams of death crews search for bodies all over the island. One man finds a child in the sand. Then he noted that there was a rope around the waist of this child. So he pulled on the rope, and there was another child. And then he picked up that child and pulled on it, and another child, and then another, and another, and then finally the sister. All 10 of the sisters and 90 orphans died in the hurricane. Isaac and his brother Joseph returned to their jobs at the Weather Bureau. In his report on the hurricane, Isaac writes he raised the storm flag as directed. He never raised a hurricane flag because the word hurricane was never part of the forecast received from Washington. At the same time, some of the more reliable signs of an approaching hurricane just weren't there early enough to warn Isaac Klein or anyone else. There was not the red sky. 
their, the barometric pressure wasn't dropping. In fact, it didn't start dropping until Saturday. Isaac Klein had used all the forecasting tools available at the time. What he didn't have were predictions from the Cubans. After the Galveston tragedy, the U.S. Weather Bureau lifts its ban on forecasts from Cuban meteorologists. Galveston has suffered the greatest natural disaster in the country's history, but it refuses to crumble. Within weeks, trolley service is restored. Banks and grocery stores open for business. Telegraph lines are back in order. Families continue to search for missing loved ones who might still be trapped within the awful wall of debris. Nearly a month later, the body of Isaac's wife is found. Under a pile of wreckage where the rest of the family landed after the hurricane's end. Most of the neighbors who had taken shelter in his home were never heard from again. Within a year, both Isaac and Joseph are assigned to positions outside of Texas, much to the dismay of their neighbors. Even after the hurricane of 1900 nearly wiped out their town, Galvestonians remained loyal to their chief weather expert. He was not run out of Galveston on a rail, tar and feathered. I don't believe Isaac Klein should be blamed for what happened, uh, simply because he was a product of his time. He was a true Texas hero. As Galveston wakes up from its nightmare, heart-wrenching decisions must still be made. People had to make a determination. Do we rebuild or do we leave? September 1900. An enormous Category 4 hurricane takes Galveston by surprise. Between 8 and 12,000 people are dead. Entire city blocks are unrecognizable. Some neighborhoods have literally vanished. People of Galveston had a decision to make whether to leave Galveston or to stay here and rebuild their city. Now, a lot of people did leave, but the vast majority of Galvestonians stayed. They had roots here and livelihoods at stake. It was the richest city in Texas. A lot of people had been here for a fairly long amount of time. Uh, the prominent families were fairly well established. The belief was that the port was still the best port in the state of Texas. And so I think a lot of people felt that the city was still salvageable. But in rebuilding, residents want a stronger, safer city. People realized that if Galveston were to survive at all, they would have to have protection from future storms. Galveston answers the challenge with a bold solution. They'll build a giant concrete seawall along the Gulf Coast to absorb the brunt of storms. And they will raise the elevation of the entire island. Work begins in 1902. This is a tremendous scientific and technological accomplishment for that time or any time. They built this giant wall, and this wall was 17 feet tall, 16 feet wide at the base, and five feet wide at the top. And it had a curved surface facing the gulf. The seawall was built to a height of 17 feet. Why? Because the maximum storm surge caused by the 1900 storm was just under 16 feet. And the thinking was then when giant waves came in, that they would go up and then fall back on the next incoming wave. It was probably one of the most impressive engineering feats uh, in the US at that particular point in time. It cost one and a half million dollars, and it weighed 20 tons per linear foot. The seawall is completed in 1904 and stretches across three miles of shoreline. The 
first test of the seawall was in 1909 when a nine-foot tide flowed into the island from a, a hurricane that came ashore about 80 miles to the south. Five die in Galveston, all in areas not protected by the seawall. The next phase of Galveston's reconstruction is even more ambitious. In order to support the wall, the city itself had to be raised to push enough mud and sand behind the wall to support it. The plan is to raise the elevation on the Gulf side to meet the top of the seawall. Then, the grade will slope down one foot for every 1,500 feet from the Gulf. More than 2,000 structures across 500 city blocks will be elevated. Houses, churches, sidewalks, sewer and gas lines, everything has to go up. Workers have only the most basic construction tools. They had hydraulic lifts that they were cranking by hand. One of the most challenging structures to raise is St. Patrick's Church, a huge, ornate building in the center of town. There were mules put on all corners of the church, and they were on a turnstile, and each mule had to walk at the same time. Because what they were trying to do is make sure they didn't have the, the structures get off kilter. While being slowly raised on jack screws, each building has to be kept level. If not, it can break apart. I can remember as a, as a young child listening to my dad and my grandfather before you die just talk about the fact that they would blow whistles and time these moves and they would just keep cranking at once, and cranking it again, and this would go on for days, weeks. The next step is to fill up the space under the raised buildings. They built dikes around sections of the city and then they had these dredges that would collect the bottom of the gulf and then bring it in and then pump it in and fill up those areas. 16 million cubic yards of sand and slurry are pumped in from the gulf. And it took weeks and months for the stuff to dry. And of course, as the sand was pumped in, so were sea creatures. So you also had the smell of all these dying things from the sea in there too. Finally, after six long and muddy years, the grade raising is complete. You can imagine the patience that it must have taken because this grade raising wasn't completed until 1910. They did the extraordinary, made it commonplace, and then they told stories about it and laughed about it afterwards. The grade raising and the seawall are engineering marvels. But the one thing that simply can't be rebuilt is Galveston's ranking as the brightest star on the Texas coast. That honor was about to be claimed by Galveston's old rival, fueled by a discovery that would change not only Texas, but the whole country. In 1901, an oil gusher called Spindle Top is discovered near Houston. The oil boom gives new urgency to Houston's dream of building a shipping channel. That's bad news for Galveston, whose own shipping channel had always been its trump card in the rivalry between the cities. Houston's new shipping channel opens in 1914. So Houston rapidly became the major port and the major city in the region. The seawall Galveston built after the 1900 storm continues to do its job. Although a storm in 1915 kills several people, the seawall protects most of the city. There's no doubt that the island is a safer place than it was before the great hurricane. But its former glory has slipped away. So the commerce just passed Galveston by and, and went on. Galveston becomes a resort town. Hurricanes strike glancing blows on the island in 1961 and 1983. Then, in September 2008, 
Hurricane Ike makes a direct hit. It's a strong Category 2 with gusts upwards of 100 miles an hour. The tropical wind field is huge, nearly 500 miles across, churning up massive waves that batter Galveston. Since the seawall fronts only about a third of the Gulf side and none of the northern shore, most of the island is unprotected. Hurricane Ike's storm surge rises as high as 11 feet. Floodwaters pour across the island. We hear the arguments about why live in a vulnerable area. Part of it is the calculated risk. Galveston's been very lucky for a long time, and human nature is to uh, kind of hope that your luck continues. Linda McDonald's grandfather was an expert on that subject. And my grandfather said, because when you know the story of the 1900 storm, when you wake up, if you're lucky enough to still be in your bed with your house around you, then you get down on your knees and you thank God because it could all be changed, it could all be gone overnight, the way it was one weekend in September in 1900 in Galveston.